how can we go about confirming in the real world that feminists are in fact female narcissists? The first way is their relationship style. There are certain behaviour patterns that are common to all narcissists. In relationships, narcissists are always abusers. In the initial honeymoon phase, the target is love-bombed and told they can do no wrong. Slowly, the narcissist will devalue the target in order to protect their ego from criticism. This creates confusion as the victim tries to reconcile the wonderful person they first met with the abuser they now see before them. Finally, after a smear campaign to destroy the victim's character, the narcissist will casually discard the victim, claiming that he or she was abusive or fundamentally flawed in some way. This is precisely what has happened with male feminists in the MeToo hashtag campaign. In the early stages, male feminists were fated as allies to the cause of feminism. In most cases, they have been devalued, and incriminating information about the victim has been shared in a smear campaign. Finally, they are discarded and thrown to the wolves. In this respect, feminism is not unlike other brainwashing cults, as the victim is constantly idealised and then re-abused, until they are stripped of their ego and become completely subservient to the demands of the cult. Smear campaigns are a fundamental part of narcissistic relationships. Now, I'm not suggesting that Harvey Weinstein is a saint, but what is significant here is the tactics that have been used to discredit the victim. At the beginning of a smear campaign, the narcissist will insinuate that they have heard things about the victim from an unidentified person. This is to intimidate the victim and put them off balance. This is precisely the dynamic in play in the recent Laurier University case in Canada. A young lecturer, Lindsay Shepard, was called into a disciplinary hearing after she showed a YouTube video in her class by Jordan Peterson, who is a respected psychology professor who happens to have politically incorrect opinions. Subsequently, it was revealed that no official complaint was ever made, and the recordings that Shepard made of the hearing perfectly demonstrate the use of innuendo and shaming tactics that narcissists so enjoy. The parallel system of justice in the hearing is highly narcissistic, as it allows the narcissist to act as judge and jury, with complete power over the victim, who is typically not able to defend herself. Now that we've looked at the relationship style of narcissists, we can look at how they communicate and how we can spot the giveaways. One of the giveaways is body language. Narcissists have a very specific body language. Let's look at Catherine Spillar, the chief executive of the National Organization of Women in the United States. Notice how her body language is closed and haughty. Now, I strongly recommend viewing this interview. There's a link in the low bar. But here, look at when Spillar shifts the blame and avoids female accountability when asked by the interviewer what reproductive rights men should have. She says, men have the right to take responsibility for birth control. Notice how one-sided this is. And then notice how she reacts to a suggestion that a man should have some say over a pregnancy. She merely responds, he should have thought of that earlier on. This, of course, absolves the woman, and by extension feminism, of all responsibility. Attention-seeking. All narcissists crave narcissistic supply. The attention and validation which feeds their weak egos and helps them to feel important. For the female narcissist, the most easily available attention is male attention. Feminists claim that their shock tactics are intended to draw attention to the plight of women, when in fact this behaviour amounts to nothing more than, look at me. Attention seeking for feminists is usually transgressive, as their protests usually happen in settings that are reserved for other people and purposes. As a rule, narcissists despise social convention and the law, unless they can directly benefit from them. 
they will also invade any private space and cross any boundary they can in order to exert control. Narcissistic rage. When narcissists are denied, they experience narcissistic rage. This occurs when other people fail to validate the narcissist's point of view or if they refuse to obey them. This could be seen in the physical and verbal hostility towards the critics of feminism. Very often, narcissists will attack not what is said, which may be true, but the person who said it and the tone in which it was said, in order to deflect criticism. Due to their weak egos, narcissists are unable to tolerate jokes or banter directed at them without becoming secretly enraged. This explains why feminist comedians are not funny. Omniscience. In any relationship with a narcissist, the narcissist will claim to understand you better than you understand yourself, and so they know what is best for you. The purpose of this behaviour is to disempower and control the victim. In feminism, and Marxism more generally, the idea of false consciousness is a perfect example of this kind of gaslighting. Feminists claim that only they are aware of the true nature of societal and gender relationships, and anyone who disagrees is not a weakened or is simply a tool of the patriarchy. Indeed, narcissists are professionals at historical revision, changing the facts and context to suit their argument. A narcissistic worldview is therefore essential to the feminist and Marxist view of history. Feminists such as Jill Matthews have claimed that the goal of feminist history is to challenge the practices of the historical discipline that have belittled and oppressed women. In plain English, this means rewriting history in accordance with the feminist victim narrative, where men are responsible for the horrors of history and women the innocent bystanders. Word salad. When threatened in an argument, a narcissist will utter a string of words that sound powerful but have no real meaning. This strange behaviour is known as word salad, or narc speak, and is designed to confuse the victim and put them on the defensive by tossing in projection, irrelevant facts, circular logic, and trigger words. The obscure and opaque nature of feminist theory is a perfect example of word salad, or, in layman's terms, it is pretentious bullshit. See this quote from Andrea Dworkin. Romantic love in pornography as in life is the mythic celebration of female negation. QED. Excessive generosity. The narcissism expert Melanie Tonya Evans notes that while narcissists generally treat strangers badly if they perceive them to be inferior, for example waiters or hotel staff, they can be extremely generous to outsiders to whom they have no relationship. This is to obtain narcissistic supply and reinforce positive perceptions of the narcissist as compassionate and kind, and at no personal cost to the narcissist, of course. This can be observed in the constant virtue signalling of feminists and their failure to follow through on the consequences of their speech. So, now that we have demonstrated that there is an overlap between the mindset and behaviours of narcissism and feminism, what are we supposed to do about this multi-billion dollar cult? We live in a world where feminist narcissists are indulged like temperamental children and given free reign to parasitise the resources of the state. This is dangerous because not only do narcissists cause terrible suffering, but their selfishness makes them entirely unfit to wield power. It is also profoundly unhealthy to hold society to the standards of a small number of miserable, mentally ill women. The solution must be to call out feminist narcissists for who they are and remove them from the public discourse. The first step is to call out their bigotry and their insane, irrational worldview. Perhaps only then can men and women, working together, accept the responsibility that leads to real social progress. <laughs>